in today's reading found in the concluding verses of Matthew's 10th chapter, we listen to the gospel writer's words on the topic of welcome. We heard that whoever welcomes another person welcomes not only that person, but Jesus and even God. We heard that whoever gives even a cup of cold water to a little one will receive a reward. And so the text naturally lends itself to reflections on hospitality, generosity, and the church's call to welcome everyone, even the little ones. These are all truths that I think we, as a people of faith, and we as the Christian church should embrace. I also believe that we receive our own spiritual reward when we welcome someone into our lives and into our church. I feel as strongly as anyone that everyone should feel as welcome as possible at God's banquet table of love. But as I sat with this morning's text, and sat with it, and sat with it some more. As I prepared to deliver a sermon on welcome and hospitality and what that really and truly means, as I began to organize my thoughts about where our church could improve in its own ministry of welcome, I realized that I was feeling uncomfortable. I felt like maybe I had been looking at this text from the back end for all these many years, and that maybe there was another approach to it. You see, I've always heard the text as instruction about how we should treat others. But as I began to look more closely at it, I feel that maybe it's giving us a heads up about how we can be expected to be treated by the rest of the world. For six chapters, Matthew has been telling the reader who Jesus was and what he believed. At the end of the fourth chapter, we find him calling his first three disciples and heading out into the countryside. In verse 23 of that chapter, he is recorded as going throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of God's dominion and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. In the next three chapters, we have what is known to most of us as the Sermon on the Mount, a collection of his teachings, a peek into his own interpretation of the Torah. We get a sense of what this good news is that he's taking out into the world. And in chapters 8 and 9, Jesus performs some miraculous healings, all while continuing to collect and gather disciples around him. These disciples are the people who hear him speak to the crowds. They're the ones who receive the explanation of his words if there happens to be any need for clarification. These disciples have watched him heal the sick, calm the winds, and even raise the dead. And in this morning's chapter, chapter 10, Jesus tells them, now it's your turn. He sends them out to do the same things that he has been doing, to cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. And he tells them in verse 7, as you go, proclaim the good news, the dominion of heaven is at hand. In other words, it's happening right now. But Jesus doesn't sugarcoat this mission. He doesn't try and paint a rosy picture of a world that is ready to receive this message. In fact, he does just the opposite. In verse 16, he says, See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. I don't know. Maybe you have felt like a sheep in the midst of wolves once or twice in your own lifetime. Maybe life has thrown you so many curveballs that you've decided it's not a very friendly place in which to live. 
And maybe you're wondering, if Jesus is the good shepherd, why in the world would he send us like sheep into the midst of wolves? I believe he is asking us to trust that he will protect us in spite of the wolves. That we must believe that we will not be devoured by the words or actions of the world's wolves. That we have a mission which is far more important than the fear we experience at the sound of nearby wolves howling at us. But let's move on to this morning's text. A text which we usually interp interpret as instructions about how we should welcome others. But Jesus wasn't telling his disciples how to welcome other people. He was telling them how they were going to be welcomed. He tells them that there will be a variety of ways in which the message will be received. And the rest of the world will see the disciples through many different lenses. Some people will call them prophets and welcome them as such. But don't let their praise go to your head. Some people will treat them as if they are righteous people. But remember how quickly opinions can and do change. Some people will, will offer just the very basics, such as a cup of cold water. Don't make judgments one way or the other because God knows what's in the heart of each person. And each person who responds to you will receive their own reward from God. Jesus affirms in this morning's opening words the same message that I shared with you last week. Last week I said that we are all made in God's own image and likeness. And so it follows, Jesus says, that whoever welcomes you welcomes God, the one who sent me. And the reverse is also true. Luke's parallel text has Jesus telling his disciples just before being sent out as sheep into the midst of wolves, whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. This is not a text about how we should treat others. It's a text about how others will treat us and how we need to let God take care of the responses of those people in other words, what others think of us is none of our business. Forty-two years ago, on October 12, 1968, Troy Perry began preaching the good news that, that the dominion of God was at hand, that God's welcome extended to everyone, including the LGBT population. It wasn't a popular message. He had many detractors. Today we reflect on that time in our history as we celebrate an event eight months later on June 28, 1969 at a New York City bar called Stonewall Inn in which LGBT people finally said enough is enough. It was the beginning of a long and difficult road to equality for the LGBT community, one which is not complete. Forty-two years is a long time. But even these many years later, you and I may feel that we are like sheep amidst the wolves of prejudice and hatred. Even these Many years later, many members of the LGBT community live in fear of being outed by others. But the Good Shepherd assures us that we are not as alone as we may feel. God watches over us. The Holy Spirit guides our ways. And the lives of those who have gone before us inspire us. That is, if we stop, and open ourselves to it. 
Friends, you and I have been given good news. And even after these 42 years, everyone hasn't heard it. This past week, I heard two people speak, one in person, the other by phone. Two people who accept that they are gay, but see it as a flaw that's going to send them to hell. That is not good news. Last Sunday, New York Times Magazine published an article about a Houston psychiatrist who is an out gay man treating people who cannot reconcile their sexual orientation with the God of their understanding. They feel that the only options are to come out as an LGBT, LGBT person and walk away from their religion or remain within their religion and try to be straight. The option he seems to present for them is to live a lie, encouraging them to remain in the closet, if that's what works for them. He lives within a city with one of the largest MCCs in the world, where, whose pastor is the former director of the Human Rights Campaign, and still he encourages his clients to remain in the closet if that works for them. Friends, this is not good news. You and I have been given good news. We know that God loves us, not in spite of who we are, but because of who we are. And the world is desperate to hear that good news. But always remember, that people's response to our good news of God's love is none of our business. How we are welcomed, or even if we are welcomed, is none of our business. Our only business is to share the news, both in word and deed, that God's love extends to everyone, including the LGBT community. And as we do, may each of us experience the freedom of God's good news for all people. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen.